Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to today's talent management webinar sponsored by Class Technologies. I hope everyone is having a great start to their week and excited as I am for today's webcast, The Power of Connection in a Virtual World. My name is Steve, and as always, I'll be working in the background here to help answer any general or technical questions you may have. Before we begin, though, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. First, there is no dial-in number for attendees. All audio will be streamed through your speakers or headphones, so please adjust your volume there accordingly. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a variety of icons. You will have access to all these tools throughout today's session, so please feel free to customize your console however you would like. Among these tools, we have the attendee chat, ask a question, and certifications. If you have any questions or experience any technical issues throughout this webcast today, go ahead and click on that purple icon marked Q&A, type your question in the box provided, and click Submit. If you have a technical question, the answer will appear here. Any content-related questions for our speakers today will be read at the end if time allows. The certification codes for this webinar will appear in the certification box located to the right of your slides once you have met the required watch time. Don't forget, you can chat with your fellow attendees by joining the live attendee chat. And finally, you will receive a link to the recording of this webinar in a follow-up email. So please allow at least 24 hours after the conclusion of the event before the information is sent. Now at this time, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to our moderator for today's webcast. We have Ashley St. John. on. Hi there. It sounds like Steve cut out, but thank you, Steve. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. Um, I'm Ashley St. John, Editor-in-Chief for Talent Management and Chief Learning Officer. Um, and in one moment, I'll hand things over to our moderator, moderator for our discussion today. But I first want to say a big thank you to Class Technologies for their sponsorship of today's event, uh, The Power of Connection in a Virtual World. We're always grateful for their partnership. Um, as we all know, technology can be a great enabler of many things, but when it comes to human connections and vir virtual work environments, it's the human in the equation that matters the most. With a world of work that continues to be largely remote, organizational leaders are more pressed than ever to help their people establish these all-important connections and feel like they're a part of something bigger. Today's discussion will focus on how to accomplish this sense of connectivity in the workplace, including creating a shared sense of values and norms, establishing a culture that prioritizes psychological safety, and more. I'd like to welcome our moderator for today's discussion, Chris Olson, Corporate Strategy and Partnerships with Class Technologies, as well as our speakers, Franklin Jones, North America Head of Learning and Talent Development with LG Electronics, and Jill Colm, VP of Talent Performance and Development with Discover Financial Services, Thank you all so much for being here. Chris, I'll pass it over to you. Um, I know that Jill was trying to uh, sign on still and was having a couple of little technical glitchy issues, so we may just hear her voice, but um, we should at least be able to hear her. So Chris, uh, take it away. Sounds great, thanks. Yeah, interesting thing about connection in the virtual world, right? So we'll mm -hmm. still find a way to connect uh, with Jill because where there's a will, there's a way. So yeah, so, thanks for joining me. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Perfect timing. Um, all right, you didn't miss anything, Jill. We actually just got started here. So we just did a quick intro of a little bit of what we're gonna be covering. Um, so we'll go down the line here with questions here for, for you too. Um, what I'd really like to do is focus on people, which is as Ashley was referring to in the beginning that it's all about humans, right? The people uh, that, that really facilitate the connection and the, you know, the tech is what, what you know, helps to enable that. Uh, and so with that, I'd love to first um, focus on the people here that are on the call. And so I'd love, maybe if we start with you, Franklin, while we get Jill situated, I just want to see if you would take a minute just to share a little bit about your career journey and your current role within, within your organization at LG. Yeah, happy to. And thank you, Chris. Um, so my early career, you know, it's interesting. I'm in HR and HR area. And uh, HR was the last place that I would have expected to end up. I was pursuing a, a career in IT and programming, and I stumbled into a, an, an L&D role, which was really a temporary gig. I, I thought it was going to, uh, to be a short-term uh, six-month uh, thing that uh, was in between where I was trying to get to. And um, I was fortunate uh, that I had a leader that uh, saw potential and started mentoring me in, uh, in learning development, HR practices, 
yeah, even though I uh, I reminded her that <laughs> that it wasn't a long term area that I was in, and then uh, fast forward um, seventeen eighteen years later, uh, I've, I've still continued to be in in L and D areas and in HR areas. So I spent eight years in satellite television uh, with uh, Direct TV in a variety of training and L&D roles in operations and leadership development. In the last nine years, I've been in a, a number of different L&D and talent management roles with LG Electronics, uh, managing performance management, succession planning, organizational design, leadership development. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been leading the learning and talent development COE for North America a region of LG. And uh, I'm fortunate I've got, uh, you know, talking about people, uh, I'm fortunate to have a, a great team. Uh, I, I'm supported by a, an awesome team. And uh, and we support the uh, employee and organizational development for all levels. So everything from emerging leaders, high potentials, executive development, um, all across the entire organization. So glad to be here and glad to, to spend time with you and everyone else on the call for the next little bit. Perfect. You you answered my follow up question, which who is your your learning audience? Um, so with that, uh, before I let you go and, and turn it over to Jill here, uh, quick question um, for how your workforce is functioning today: uh, Is it remote? Is it hybrid? Is it in person? Um, I'm just curious what you're where you're currently at today and how you're um, how you're you're working. And then uh, and then the the follow up is: Do you do you plan to stay that way? Or are you going to make any adjustments further down the road? Yeah, so I think the answer to that is all of the above. Uh, we we have a, and I think we have a good blend of all three. So we have some employees that provide in-home service to customers or work in manufacturing facilities that um, their, their job is on site every day uh, at that location. But most of our workforce really has flexibility to be hybrid. Um, that means something different for every employee, uh, whether it's you know, a day or two or three in the office, but uh, the majority of our workforce is flexible, hybrid arrangements in them. Um, a new thing for us is really through the pandemic, identifying a, a population that can be fully remote all the time. And uh, you know, if, if we go back three years ago, I, I would have said, no, that's not who we are as an organization and, and we've changed. And so We've we've learned a lot um, on you know how work can be done and uh, so yeah I mean going forward you know, outside of the pandemic and the future beyond that stage uh, our plans are to continue to uh, to have a lot of flexibility and hybrid arrangements um, you know it, it is important for people to collaborate and connect and while a lot of that can be done uh, virtually and remotely there's still a certain element of being in person. And I think you know, hybrid kind of allows that mix of um, when it's right to be in person and to connect in person, having the ability to do that in office spaces and locations. And um, and then when, uh, we, when we really need to put our head down and focus on task and getting work done, having the flexibility to, to spend those days uh, in a location that, uh, that's more um, more conducive to that. So, I, you know, beyond the pandemic, I think one of the, one of the challenges that I, I think are ahead of us and probably most companies, when we went home, we were still doing very synchronous work. Uh, we, we did hybrid or we did remote work in the same way that we did it in the office. And, and that was okay and it was a learning experience, but um, we're, we're trying to now figure out how to shift to more asynchronous work where hybrid in the future looks different than what hybrid today looks like. So we're, we're a hybrid, we have remote, um, we do have some on site, um, but the way in which we do hybrid is definitely a journey that uh, we're trying to get further along from where we are today, if that answers your question. Yeah, I, and I don't think you're alone in that. I, I, I don't know that there's any one company that's mastered hybrid. It's this elusive white whale that, you know, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get it sorted one day. Um, but perfect, thanks for that. And we'll, we'll certainly uh, dig deep into some of those things that you mentioned there. So um, Jill, I'd love to turn it over to you. I'd love to get a quick synopsis on, on your background of your career and what brought you to your current role here at Discover. 
All right. Can you all hear me? Um, my computer is, I'm having computer issues, so I'm hoping that you can hear me. Is that, is that good? We, we can. You sound, you sound great. Okay. All right. Well, soon I hopefully will be, you'll be able to see me, but hello and thanks so much for having me. Um, Jill Kahn, I started my career um, unexpectedly in retail and spent the first part of my career in retail. Um, I have a happenstance way of, of coming to HR, but there was two things I loved about my sales role in retail. One was developing people, and two was just interacting with people and helping them get to where they wanted to be. And after that, um, I've spent my career in multiple industries from retail to technology to software, medical device. Um, I took a turn in uh, telecommunications as well and now find myself in financial services. I think one of the things that I've learned throughout my career is just having a transferable skill set can take you into many different industries. I've also spent a majority of my career in the learning and development space in three different areas, customer service, sales, and in the leadership and executive leadership space. Over the past few years, I've had the privilege to be able to expand my um, my career into other places such as DE&I, talent management, succession planning, and also employee engagement and people analytics. And so um, what I've come to know about myself is that I really do love connecting all the dots. Um, much like Franklin's role, uh, I get to I have the privilege of being able to help others um, within HR connect things that sometimes may seem disparate across an organization. So um, that's me. I'm excited to be here. Lovely, lovely. And and so it's are you are you organization wide? Is there any one target audience that you really that you and your team really focus on? At Discover? Um, I, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. So yes, we're um, organizationally, we have about 18,000 folks at Discover. We have folks that sit in our field and in our headquarters. Um, my team covers the whole organization and we um, not only do performance management for the whole organization, but also leadership and employee development. Mm -hmm. Got that. Yep, and the succession planning, all the fun stuff. Um, yes. And and with that, um, so so how is your workforce operating today? Um, just so we can level set with the rest. Are you kind of in that in that uh, purgatory in between phase of us of, of trying to figure out hybrid? Are you um, are you remote? And if so, like what's that percentage wise? Just curious and how how your operating model is today. Yeah. So um, right now we're hybrid. Uh, we just relaunched and reopened our offices in Riverwood, where the headquarters are. We also have several contact centers that we have throughout the U.S., and we do have some folks that are global. Uh, but our big lean-in recently has been into this hybrid workforce and how does it, what does it look like? Our rooftop kind of talent strategy of where are we getting employees? Um, many parts of our organization are still hiring remote employees that would be remote all the time. So. Um, kind of two different places I would say we are. We're in that space where we're hiring remote employees and then we still have folks that are hybrid that live near um, an office and are coming in part of the time and then are being at home part of the time. Got it, great. And and uh, and it sounds like that's gonna be pretty much the trajectory for, for, for the foreseeable future, basically, for Discover? Yes, for the near term, absolutely. Got it, great. Well, um, let, let's, let's focus on that. And so um, while I got you, Jill, I'm, I'm going to give you follow up questions on some of that. So with with being in, in hybrid and some being full remote, um, I'm curious how, what are the ways that you create and, and focus on connection and community based experiences with your workforce? I'm sure uh, you probably have had some learnings along the way in the last couple of years, um, and how you how you create that sort of uh, vibe within your organization virtually. So I'm just curious uh, what, you know, what has been some of the pain points, lessons learned, um, just anything over the last two years and, and piece of advice you have to offer on creating connection and community based experiences. Yeah, you bet. There's really two things, um, two main things that come to mind that we've really leaned into. Um, one is around communication. So over the last two years, the organization has really upped our game in communicating. I think many organizations did this when the pandemic hit, which is 
how do we give information to more people more often so that they know what's going on and where we're headed. You know, even in just talking about uh, us reopening our offices, uh, we had several false starts in that space. So, you know, we had planned to open the office last summer, and then we planned to open the office in the fall, and then we had to kick it back out to April. And um, and so, you know, we realized that we really, at that time, we just couldn't put a date in, you know, a line in the sand. And then we were able to finally do that because we had to catch because we were we had kept pushing it. And so um, now that it's open, we just have a different way of communicating, like what the status of the office is, is and if people could come in or, you know, we have a like a ranking scale that tells people about what's happening at the organization. So that's one way we've done that. Um, we still actually have a couple of operating mechanisms that we put in place during the pandemic, which was um, meetings with officers in the organization, all officers in the organization on a monthly basis. We also do a director and above conversation plus town halls four times a year. And then each organization also does town halls. And so that's been one way that we really leaned into working with employees. A second one is we did virtual and um, drive through volunteer events to create community within the organization. Mm -hmm. So these were our opportunity that people could participate across the organization. There was a wholly virtual one that we just did about eight weeks ago. And um, that's been another way for us to create that community. So I'd say those two are the biggest things that we've done, along with our engagement survey of just doing pulse checks on how employees are doing, what's going on with them, et cetera. Interesting. So on the engagement side of it, um, there's, I've, there's I've, I've just been reading all the reports around virtual and how the impacts that it's had on, in the positives that people have experienced, you know, in addition to the obvious flexibility, things like that, uh, productivity, engagement. I'm curious if you, did you see any big shifts from going from being in person to going into more of a remote hybrid state of uh, increase of engagement, dips in engagement? I'm just curious what the results were. Yeah, actually, um, like most organizations, I think a lot of people saw a huge engagement bump when we first got into the pandemic because we were playing, we were really paying a lot of attention to employees. It has started to drop over the last month as we've let go of some things that we were consistently doing during the pandemic. So we're looking at how do we increase that engagement again? Um, overarchingly, over the financial industry, um, they're also all of us are seeing that that engagement dip. Um, mm. We think it has a lot to do with fatigue. Uh, and what we call people's capacity, how much work they're doing, and are people overwhelmed and getting burnt out. Um, so we're still looking at ways that we are leaning into how to get that to be um, better than it is today. Uh, one of the things that we're actually doing right now is we have an employee value proposition for the organization that um, we're working with an external vendor to look at employees' employee experiences around meaningful work and career growth. So they'll come in and kind of surgically look at our processes, interactions with people, technology as well, to tell us where we're falling down um, in how employees are working within the organization and like where's their, where there's friction for what we're doing. So that I think that's also going to be a place where it's going to help us regain some of that engagement with the organization. Perfect. There's certainly a follow-up question I have for that, but I'm gonna put a pin in it so that way we can give Franklin a, a chance to, to weigh in on some of this. Um, Great. Franklin, um, for, for you, I'm, I'm curious around what, what are the ways and the lessons learned that you've experienced over the last two years with, with LG and, and how you, what, what are some of your recommendations for how you would create connection and uh, community-based experiences in, in your organization? Yeah, you know, I, I had to laugh a little bit when Jill was talking about the whole start and restop and start and restop because it uh, it made me think about um, when you know, when the pandemic hit and uh, we went home for two weeks <laughs> and it went a little bit beyond two weeks and from uh, from a, a program side and we're looking at learning development programs and leadership programs and we've got all these plans for the year we. Uh, we kind of put a pause and we canceled everything the next couple of weeks. And then all of a sudden it, uh, well, it's going to be another week or another two weeks. And it's just day by day that we're making these changes. Um, and 
uh, okay, we're, we'll be back in the summer of 2020. And then just, yeah, th- that uh, crazy time. And, and it's still a little bit of that, but very different than it was um, at the start of pandemic. And you know, when I look at you know, my community experiences, that's the one thing that I think right away, in some ways, um, we lost. I think everyone lost. We, we went home. Uh, we pack up our stuff. We, we cancel all the programs, events, everything that's happening in person. From a learning development standpoint, we, we rolled out very quickly, you know, Udemy and LinkedIn Learning and all these digital resources. So the ability to learn and grow and develop is there. Uh, people have access to, you know, to, to WebEx and different platforms to be able to have calls. Um, but the, the community practices really went away. Um, people aren't using video on calls. They're uh, very disconnected with how those calls were happening right off the bat. Uh, learning was happening, but there was no tabletop discussions, flip chart exercises, collaborating in, in those forms. And so um, we were in, you know, I think, survival mode at first. And as we got to you know, a few months into the pandemic, we realized that um, you know, things weren't going to change and we had to really retool our, our programs and and how we operate and so a few things that we did um on the general employee side we we started taking content or programs that we had that were typically classroom based that we had digital alternatives to that and we would create a, a weekly discussion group so here's the a flip cr- classroom ch- approach where here is you know 30 minutes worth of content that you need to take during the week digitally. And then we meet for an hour and a half and people have their cameras on. We're talking face to face on the learnings. We're going into breakout rooms and giving people 10 minutes to discuss part of that. So really simulating those tabletop and those flip chart activities. So learning wasn't an isolated individual approach. We're bringing that community back into it, even though we we're all virtually and, um, and we called it a virtual hybrid, but that methodology would take a, a classroom course and the majority of it you can learn on your own, but you can't have the discussion on your own. And so we started operating those uh, the second half of 2020. Um, we, we, uh, we tested and piloted it with some of our content and uh, it became very popular. And we've continued to operate that even as we've gone back to some in-person training and we found that for some uh, for some areas, such as um, you know, first time people manager, it really has been a better long term approach. I, I don't think we'll go back to the in person that uh, this this virtual hybrid community seems to be a better opportunity for that particular uh, group. So that, you know, that's one area. Um, you know, c- creating community. When we look at our high potential programs. It, uh, those stopped altogether because those were very community focused, in person focused, team building, interaction, facilitation, and content. And so, uh, in the fall of 2020, when we started trying to get back into that, um, we uh, we were trying to figure out, you know, how, how do we how do we build community experiences into this and and people experiences, and uh, and so we we started brainstorming and talking through what can we do and. Um, you know, my team and I, we were, uh, we were buying, we were going online shopping for mini marshmallows and Teddy grams and, and, and chocolates, buying tea candles and, and packaging up these, uh, these s'more kits to send out to the group. And, um, we, we went back to having these trainings virtually where you could see each other and have breakout rooms, but we started integrating like evening experiences where we had a, a, a s'mores night. We sat around the campfire. People put virtual backdrops up and we were roasting marshmallows at our desk at home and uh, talking about you know what people are binge watching and what's going on in their families and school and kids. And, and just aside from the training, bringing those evening hours back to, uh, to certain key training experiences that were taking place for our high potential and uh, leadership development programs. So that, that was huge. Um, and we, we did paint nights and other things. Now at this point, there's so many companies that have popped up that do this for you, but early on in 2020, uh, there, there wasn't anything we were, we were figuring out on our own. And you know, I, I think the question we asked ourselves, it was really key was, you know, how might we, 
connect people? How might we bring people together? Just that how might we constantly, um, everything that we were redesigning and trying to retool, asking how can we bring people together, not just to, to get content, but to network and to, to have time together. As an organization, some unique things happen. We, we did a, a, a virtual Thanksgiving uh, preparation. We, uh, we're LG. We, we have appliances that we, that we make. We have amazing appliances <laughs> that we make. <laughs> but um, we, had, we had a professional chef that, uh, that did a, a virtual cooking experience with all of our employees. We're invited to join our employees and their families. They could join from their home. They could learn about uh, LG's newest products, and they could uh, learn how to cook uh, Thanksgiving meals with a Korean twist to them. And uh, it was it was a really neat experience. They walked away with recipes and the ability to go back and try something new that year for Thanksgiving. And so it um, it definitely the pandemic was was a nice catalyst to be able to to change how we viewed the way that people connect. Um, you know, fast forward to uh, you know, last right year and this that year. Right there What's that it? you just said. Did, did you catch, did, did, I hope everyone caught that, that the pandemic caused and, and, and created a way for us to rethink human connection. Like, so I, that, that was just like money right there is always going to call out. So continue. Oh, that. yeah, yeah. I should, I should license it. Um, yeah. TNF. Looking at currently yeah, where we're at, um, as we're going back into the offices and back into these uh, experiences in person, we, or we have maybe half the people that are remote, half the people that are in person, that's a whole another challenge. And honestly, it's a more complicating challenge, complicated challenge than what I think we faced in uh, 2020. And so we've, you know, we've, we've experimented a lot, really kind of going back to that, how might we bring community when half the people are here and half aren't, the last thing that we wanted to do is to start running programs where you've got 10 people in a room together and 10 people remotely, and they're all watching from a bird's eye cam what's happening inside the room um, and just completely disconnected and isolated from that experience. And so we've played around with things like hooking up webcams to each table and having everything mic'd and using uh, OBS Studio is, a, is, a, is an amazing platform that's pretty easy to, to learn, but to where we can queue up you know, each table and you can, you can give people that are at home the experience of being in a class or in a session with that group at their table. There's uh, Facebook portals and different uh, mobile kind of tablet type technologies that you can, you can bring into a classroom and, and integrate into breakout sessions to where you can have this really interesting hybrid approach to where half the people are remotely, half the people are in person, but the experience for both is very connected. Uh, they, they feel like they belong and they're part of that cohort and that team. And they don't feel like they're just someone joining a webinar that's uh, for the next eight hours or next two days, just having to sit and listen. It takes, it takes a lot of work. But um, there's definitely technology. And again, I think if there's that mindset of, you know, how might we connect people? How might we create community? You'll find the ways to integrate the technology with your team or with your organization, your department, uh, if that is what's on top of mind. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a constant moving target. We've, we've shifted as, uh, as time has gone on, but we've, we've learned how to, I think we did a very good job of in 2020, uh, changing the virtual experience for employees, and then in 2021, learning how to to change the hybrid experience. Um, and of course, now as we're in 2022, um, to some extent, it's a lot more heavy in person. And then getting back into that and learning how do we, as it's shifted to maybe 90% in person and 10% remote, how do we still uh, focus on bringing that 10% or 5% or 2% that are remote with that same connectivity experience that we were providing in 2020 and 2021 uh, today. So that's, that's where our focus is now is, um, as we're more heavy into the in-person continuing to still bring what we were bringing the last two years to that remote audience. Love it. Yeah. So a couple things on that, the, um, uh, the, I love the concept of food in general. So I love to eat, but it's a good community type 
type uh, uh, event. And then the s'mores is also uh, very, I mean, we think about it, campfires are where you, you know, sit and exchange stories and, and connect, you know, so s'mores is the perfect, perfect choice there to, <laughs> to facilitate that. Um, and then the, there's something also key that you said as well around, um, around technology and connection and people. And so we actually have a mantra class where technology doesn't solve problems, but people do. And so, you know, what they, people will find a way to connect and then you'll find the tech that you need to do it. And uh, just wait till you all get a load of class because uh, that's that, that's what we specialize in, what we care about. So, um, so thank you for that. So, uh, Jill, I want to I want to turn to you. And so, uh, a couple things that I want to hit on. We we're kind of hinting at it before. You you were just starting to get there, which is around um, something around like values and and uh, and the norms within your organization and. Uh, real quick, but actually, before I go into my real question in chat, we just had a, a quick follow-up question to um, learn about what the company is using for your employee engagement tool to gauge everyone's uh, uh, engagement levels. Yeah, so we use Glint as a platform yeah, for, for that. Perfect. Yeah, familiar with them. Um, so excellent. So in, if anyone needs to know Glint, G-L-I-N-T. So. Uh, great. So with that, um, I'm curious around how you create a sense of, ultimately, I would say a sense of purpose within your organization where they can feel connected to that purpose and that everyone's kind of working and swimming in the same direction. So, uh, and I would also weave into that a sense of belonging as well, too. So they're, they're kind of two separate things, but I feel like there's a lot of overlap and connection mm -hmm. within those. So I'd love to hear how you how you achieve that at discover yeah i think those two things are really connected to and purpose is such a, an ominous word to all of us right now is it is it personal purpose is it organizational purpose is do i feel like i have um am i getting the recognition i deserve do i feel valued in the organization so we're looking at purpose from multiple perspectives because we, we what we've found is that it's not just about the organization, it's really about like, what's my contribution? Do people see my contribution? And how am I being recognized for that? So for us, um, ways that we're doing that, I mean, I would say, in, and in connection with belonging is through storytelling. And mm. uh, just as an example, I was in a program last week that we were rolling out about inclusive leadership and de &I and why is it important to the organization and uh, there was a point in the conversation where the question was posed to all of us as leaders, like, what does DNI mean to you and why is it important to you? And instead of talking about, well, DNI is important to me because of blah, 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 people were telling personal stories and connecting in that format. And so that's been something that we've really leaned into, whether it's, um, telling a story through data or telling a story about from a personal perspective and how you've overcome something or why something's important to you. That's really been our connection point. And what we've found is that when we start to tell those stories and people connect on a personal level, that really does create that sense of belonging that I'm hearing about someone else struggling. Oh my gosh, that resonates with me. That's how I'm feeling. And, um, we've been able to leverage that in multiple ways. So whether it's um, storytelling on a town hall or we had people storytelling about, um, we just launched quarterly check-ins at Discover and people were telling stories about their experience and what that means when they're getting great feedback from their leader, whether it's um, things that they need to improve or things that they're doing well and, um, and what that means to them so that we can we can continue to create that um, that connection between the manager and employee, that connection back to the organization, and and what kind of recognition those folks are getting in those experiences. Love it, love it. Um, all right, I want to. We're about thirty-seven minutes into this, so I'm I'm going to pause for questions from the group. I've been paying attention to chat a little bit here, but Ashley, I just want to see if there's anything. Uh, that I might have uh, overlooked that we might want to spend some time on. Um, someone did ask in, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in the in the Q and A, 
they said Franklin mentioned a platform he used for the hybrid meetings, and they were wondering if he could um, repeat it because they missed that. Yeah, so um, OBS Studio, it's a uh, an open source, it's, it's, it's a free platform. It's not so much used, it's, uh, it's a broadcasting tool, a broadcast producing tool. Um, it has a little bit of a learning curve, but you can overlay it onto any platform, Zoom, WebEx, no matter what. And essentially what you do is you can take any audio source, any camera source, PowerPoint slides, video footage, whatever you want, and then you can output it through the webcam feed into Zoom or WebEx or whatever platform you're using. So essentially, you can curate the experience that you want anyone remotely. Whatever table is talking, you can cue that table, and that becomes the webcam feed from uh, from your organization. Um, you can zoom. If you've got a camera on the facilitator, you can do that. If you're showing a video, they get the video in full screen and clarity and audio. So OBS Studio, um, it's a... Uh, it's, there's, a, there's a learning curve to it, but it, um, it's a great application, and there's a lot of unique things you can do with it to produce, I think, a, a, a fantastic hybrid or virtual experience in a, an event. You know, something that's similar to what you've done, Franklin, um, one of the hybrid kind of like norms that we've set up at Discover is that if you have people that are remote and people that are in a room, everyone in the room has their laptop open and up and they're also on the web platform that you're using, whether it be Teams or Zoom or whatever, so that uh, people can see each other's faces. So instead of seeing a big room of people, you're able to see individual pictures of folks too. That's that's how we've solved that hybrid yeah. aspect as well. And that is, a, yeah, it's, it's a great, a great practice as well. Um, I agree hundred percent. Yeah, that's interesting that you say that because you think of, I'm thinking of like education classroom setting, um, but you're usually sitting and you're staring at the back of everyone's heads. And uh, now with with uh, what we have today, you're actually seeing their face in the virtual space here, which is kind of interesting. Um, the uh, on that note too, um, on hybrid, you know, one of the things that I often hear in the market is creating equitable experiences between the two, and that's the big problem to solve in hybrid. How do you make it so that those that are um, they're joining in person that they're not getting favored uh, over those that have joined virtually and, and vice versa, uh, because there's actually ways that you can have that. So I think we're still figuring that out unless anyone has some secret sauce they're willing to share on that. Um, but but the in terms of equity and, and accessibility, uh, the things that we're hearing a lot is that there's a lot of opportunities that have opened up for others that haven't had them before, because this is sort of level the playing field. Additionally, um, if you look into the research, the those that choose to want to work from home overwhelmingly are people of color that are getting more advantages and being from uh, from being able to have that. Uh, and so I just think of all the different opportunities that we're now able to give in a more equitable way. And so I'm curious what you what you've seen in regards to, I would say one, in, in the equ in the equity arena, as well as for the um, uh, psychological safety and, and how, how you help to facilitate an equitable and psychological safe environment uh, to have the conversations and to, in, that you would want to have that matter to create the, the, um, the things of uh, moments of connection. So um, Jill, Jill, I'll start off with you. Cause there's a lot in that question, but I'm trying to hit it all. <laughs> so, no worries. Um, I'm just going to start with connection. I think, um, you know, a couple of things that we do. One is we have a matrix where we show where people are at capacity and where they are on morale. So it's a physical way to see where the whole team is and then facilitate a conversation if someone is below the line from a morale perspective or below the line in a capacity perspective. So that's that's been one thing that we've done and it actually opens up the conversation the second thing, is, and I know lots of people have different feelings about this, but giving people the voice to be able to ask a question anonymously, I think is something that creates some psychological safety for the organization. You know, um, We want people to put their names to things, but until we're all ready to do that, I think there's what we've done is we've given people the opportunity to ask questions anonymously and also ask questions with their name attached to it. 
which creates another level of, I think, safety for folks for them to ask tougher questions. Um, another way we've done that is just opened up an email channel and people can send in a question for a town hall or something like that, that we're able to capture and, and take into that perspective. Um, really for me, uh, you know, I just joined Discover five months ago and for four months, I really didn't get to meet my team. And so what's been really nice for us has been, we've, we've built in time for team development where we not only did things like tell me a little bit about yourself and how you operate and how you work, but we did a strengths finder activity with each other. Um, each week on our staff meeting, we have a word of the week or something fun that we add to our weekly meeting to like lighten things up as well as we had like a total virtual Christmas party that had a jeopardy where people answered a bunch of questions and then you had to guess who that person was and there was prizes and we utilized a really fun online tool for that. But I think the most important thing that we need to do as leaders every day is just ask people how they're really doing. And mm. you know, that's the point where you actually probably get the best answer of the day of like, how's it really going? And tell me where you are today and how things are shaping up or, you know, just giving the space for it and not just always focusing on the work. Um, one thing to follow up on that, I'm, I'm going to see if I can find it um, and you know, try and walk and chew gum at the same time. But I recently um, was just involved in a LinkedIn discussion around the simple uh, uh, power of just asking how someone is. And, uh, and so it's just very timely that you, that you called that out and mentioned that. Um, so I'm going to pull it up and I'm going to drop it in chat for anyone that wants to read around that because it just exploded with people literally saying how they genuinely felt uh, on, on there. And it was just really amazing to see and be a part of that. So I'll find that and, and put it in chat for everyone to, to uh, read and review. And there's a great question that came in through chat. And so uh, this came from Christina A. And so she asked, what are some ways and metrics that are being tracked around engagement, virtual, on-site? Just kind of curious around, you know, there's a lot around surveys. And my, uh, my observance of the market and all this and, and what I've heard from everyone is that surveys are great, but they can be biased or influenced or temporary. But what about, um, you know, it, what I'm hearing is people are going more around like data, data, like user mm -hmm. behavior data, people analytics data, because that's really where the truth lies. So surveys are a factor, but not the factor. Um, so with that, I would, you know, in, even at class, one of the things that we do is we, you know, we track the real time engagement of everyone that's in the class and like who's focused, who's not focused. And so we take a look at a lot of the, and we're all virtual, so it's, it's so we don't have the on site components into it yet. But, um, but that's where we tend to focus on that to give the, you know, the, the real time updates to kind of get the read of the room that you miss out when you're in the in person space. Um, so I'm curious, like, uh, we'll, we'll start with you, Franklin, here, if you could weigh in on that. Like, are there any measurements that you're looking at that? Uh, show the effectiveness between the two? What is there a sweet spot? Um, are you measuring, I don't know, something like how long the instructor is talking and lecturing versus allowing others to speak um, in facilitation conversations? So I'll throw it to you and, and see whatever you have to say on measurements and engagement. Yeah, yeah. when it comes to, to some of those areas, you know, I think um, to your point, you know, surveys, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's part of it. It gives you a little bit of a story and tells you a little bit of information. Um, I think when this topic we're talking about right now around connectivity and people being together, like that's key. And so when you look at, you know, within a, a class or a course or a program, how often are people connecting together? We push very hard to try to integrate a lot of breakout content, um, breakout discussions, breakout, breakouts that have value, not just breaking out for the sake of breaking out, but where there's less facilitation. And uh, and we do try to monitor uh, programs from time to time. If we see heavy facilitation, heavy um, lecturing, then uh, we, we provide that feedback to our, our, uh, our partners that um, we, we need people more time connected together. Um, so, you know, that's, that's some of it is just you know, the, the monitoring, the observing. Um, we've seen in sessions where they're heavily people focused and people connecting together 
that uh, the feedback is overwhelmingly high uh, compared to uh, to the I'm sitting on a four hour online lecture. Um, and so that's that's part of what drives that behavior. Uh, if we're going to to sit on a call together, or sit on a, a virtual experience together, there needs to be people connecting with each other through that. Um, the other part, you know, look at you know how effective is it. Um, a lot of our programs we have we have self work components to it. So there's thought work, there's pre work, there's there's work that needs to be done outside of the virtual session. And so we monitor and we look at uh, what is the completion, how much time are people spending in that online content, um, that thought work content when they come to the breakouts. Have they done the thought work that they're bringing into that session, or um, is it just on the fly? And um, I think that you know that that does speak a little bit to how effective is that particular program if people are only sitting in the virtual experience and not doing the work outside of that. Um, it's, it's probably that the content of the program itself needs to be revised and, and retooled a little bit. It's not meeting the uh, the needs, but for for an, a program that is high engagement, um, people are doing the work outside of the the virtual connectivity because there's meaning to the work that they're doing. Love it, love it. Um, all right, I we're, we're getting short on time, and, and I think we've been getting some more questions. So I just want to check in with Ashley real quick to see anything outstanding in there. One I did peek in and see. Uh, thank you for for who was uh, vulnerable to sh mention um, when you uh, when what how do you change when a boss asks you how are you but you don't trust them to share honestly uh, so the thing that I would reference on that there's quite a few different tactics um, I think that there's a lot of things uh, usually it's a trust element in there right and so if you don't trust them that's where I think looking and reading into speed of trust help build that which is a Franklin Covey uh, resource. Um, there, I think it, it, you know, it does take two to tango, but I think that would give a little bit of pointers on how to build that trust in the relationship. The other one um, that I would reference that's a little bit uh, uh, more lighter and broken down in different segments around that is uh, Radical Candor. Um, so you can go to RadicalCandor.com. There's a great podcast that actually uh, goes through episodes where um, they will uh, really uh, hone in and pinpoint on how to have those difficult conversations. Um, so. I'm a big fan of that, and I feel free to share any other resources, uh, Jill and Franklin, if you have anything else that you want. Yes, to I, yeah, about. I would. I would add. Brene Brown has done a lot of work around vulnerability, and I think she really highlights the importance of um, needing to open up. So maybe I don't trust my leader, or I trust that they care about how I am. But as you're creating part of that problem, if if you're shutting down the uh, the gate to vulnerability or opening that trust up, and so. Um, there's a number of, uh, of books and, and resources from her as well that I, I think will help help increase that understanding of the importance of your role in uh, taking the lead in creating a space that's safe as well. Maybe, maybe my leader doesn't, but what power do I have as an employee to still move forward with opening that space up? Yeah. Jill, anyone, any resources you find helpful in that regard? Uh, yeah, all yeah. of the above. I mean, I think all those are a really great um, place to start. There's another great book um, called uh, Compassionate Leadership, um, How to Do Hard Things in a Human Way, which is really um, awesome about you know, how you can create more presence and how do you be more present in any given situation. Um, plus it has a lot of work on resiliency and mindfulness and leadership, which is another great place to start. And being present also requires you to be vulnerable at times as well, so. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, connections with managers and leaders in this remote space. Uh, clearly managers had to shift and pivot in how they manage their teams, right? And so uh, I, the, there's was some shocking things where people try to monopolize 
on the control for the more old school managers that exist out there. Um, I just learned that there was um, there's a chair that will detect when you get up from it and walk away and it signals your manager to let them know, like, guys, if you're doing that, you're doing it the wrong way. I'm just gonna tell you right now. So um, anyways, it's, but I think what it's still others had to, what I hope in, in this is that some trust is elevated. Unfortunately, it doesn't sound like for everybody, but I think like that the interesting thing is like it almost forced us to have to trust and rely on each other from a distance versus monitoring someone to make sure butts are in seats. But um, anyways, I'll get off my soapbox there for that little piece. But uh, I, I'll I want to check in with Ashley real quick because I think our our uh, our Q and A has been coming alive here. So yeah, um, I <clears throat> I thought this was kind of an interesting one. Um... I've heard a lot of great individual team connection ideas, s'mores, Jeopardy, Christmas party, but how do you implement team connection at scale? How do we formalize these social elements so each leader is empowered to do it? And I'm not sure who wants to tackle, tackle that. Um, so I'll chime in just for a second. And I don't, I, you know, because uh, I, I hear this a lot because within our programs, we do we do um, social responsibility elements and different things. And I I always hear, oh, this is great. Um, when's the company going to sponsor or put out a platform or a process so that way it empowers leaders to do it? And I, I had this conversation last week with a leader, actually, and it's a fairly frequent conversation. And you know, my question typically is, you know, as a leader you can take your team out to drinks after work, right? Yes. So why can't you take them to a, a soup kitchen? Um, it, uh, sometimes the barriers that as leaders that we're putting in place for why we can't do something or that we need something to scale or to be able to be put in place to give me the authority or the authorization or the, the flag that says, yes, you can go ahead and do it. Sometimes that's in our mind. Um, and we don't try or take risk or or do things. And so, I mean, my my advice is is typically always like unless someone's telling you no, you can't do it, then um, then do it. I mean, don't wait for a, a program to be put in place if it's the right thing to do and it's a good thing to do and it's um it's going to build a team that uh, is more cohesive together. Then that's mm -hmm. part of why you're a leader. Take the lead and stick your neck out there a little bit and, and move forward um, and make a difference. So my thoughts. Thanks so much, Franklin. I actually did have one more question come in that I believe was directed to you specifically. Um, they said, without knowing too much about OBS Studio, how different is it from MS Teams? Um, very different. Yeah, very different. So, um, yeah, M MS Teams, like most of their platforms, the, the learning curve's small. It's built more for the intuitive, any user experience. OBS Studio, a little more technical. If you got someone who has some tech savvy, you can probably pick it up pretty quick with YouTube videos. But um, two very different platforms. Uh, OBS Studio is kind of the back end that can run the entire experience and feed it into MS Teams, WebEx, uh, whatever platform you're using, OBS uh, Studio is really the uh, the back end framework that uh, that makes makes the miracles happen. So so it's yeah it's 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 a very it's two different things if that makes sense. Two different platforms. Think of a broadcast studio. Um, you got a broadcast studio and they've got 10, 15 different screens all going. They're deciding which camera to queue up and are they going to the reporter in the field or here or there. And they're curating this experience that the user at home gets. OBS Studio is really bringing that broadcast studio, um, and then you're feeding it out through the uh, the camera feed of whatever platform you choose. Uh, but the back end, you're running a broadcast studio um, just from your laptop, though. Thank you. Um, I think we've got about three minutes left, Chris. So I'll I'll pass it over back to you to kind of wrap things up. Oh man, goodness. yeah. So uh, overall, I, I just want to say thank you to both. I, I want to be brief here because we just got three minutes. So, um, any other last-minute parting thoughts, uh, profound wisdom you want to share in a part uh, on the last note for where others should focus on to make sure that they're creating connection in their virtual space in their organizations? 
Um, you get one minute, and so <laughs> go ahead, Jill. Be human. That's, I think, like for me, uh, sharing that you're having a good day, that you're having a bad day, that you just had a win or you just made a mistake, or I think just like as a leader, being a human, like you're doing, you know, you're going through the same thing that everyone else is going through. You're working from home. You got kids walking in your office. You got dogs, you know, going around. But like making it light enough that those things just happen and you keep moving on. I mean, 45 minutes today for me to try to get on this webinar, right? It's like, it is what it is. You just gotta, you just gotta roll with it sometimes and not, not really try to let it upset you. So I'd Love say it. being vulnerable is really key. Love it. I actually just bought a t-shirt. It says 100% human on it. So, um, okay. Uh, uh, Ari Franklin, you got, you got one minute. What's your last parting thought? Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, I, I agree 100%. And I, couldn't have said it any better than Jill. I, you know, being kind, being human, and just everything goes along with that. Um, that's, I think, the the biggest takeaway. And um, you know, just just to kind of build on that piece, there's there's a lot of conflict in the world. Um, people have conflict and challenges in their own homes, uh, and in, in their families, in their workplace, at school, and just everywhere. And when you're leading and when you're managing an organization or a team or a department, like that's, if you're, if you care about people, if you're, you know, this focus of being kind, being human, loving people, the other stuff you'll figure out, you'll figure out ways to figure out. Um, but just having your mindset in the right place of caring about people, um, resolving the things that you do have control over and, and yeah, be, be human, be kind, love people. Um, yeah, it's 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 the most important. We don't spend eight, ten, twelve hours of work uh, each day um, just to just to get a paycheck. This it's, it needs to be more meaningful than that. So, as a leader, give your people more meaning than than just showing up and getting a paycheck. Got it. Yeah, great. All right, Ashley, I'm going to turn over back to you, but I just want to call it. I found some other Q and A questions that I found fascinating as well. So, Elizabeth Green. And uh, in May, uh, your, your, your fact on, on McKinsey there with the report, I'm going to follow up with both of you directly um, with, with uh, and I'll CC my, my panelists here to, on, on those to give you a response to your questions there. So turn it over to you, Ashley. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, and thank you all. Thank you, Chris, Franklin, Jill, for the conversation today. And um, thank you to all of you for joining us for this discussion. Uh, and of course, a big final thank you to CLASS for their sponsorship of today's webinar. Um, and we're just looking forward to, to seeing you at, at our next one. So Steve, I'll let you do uh, closing, um, closing thoughts. Thank you so much, Ashley. And I'm gonna be the third one to say thank you to all our panelists today. Uh, we apologize for any technical issues that we um, experienced, but we uh, do appreciate you guys hanging on and uh, listening in. So thank you again for all that support. Uh, once once again, thank you to our sponsors, Class Technology. Uh, we appreciate their ongoing support as well. Uh, be sure to register for our next CLO, or sorry, our next webinar, which is from our sister brand, CLO Webinars. This one titled Virtual Real Reality, Where to Invest and Why. This is taking place Thursday, May 19th, 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. This concludes today's webcast. Stay safe, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.